Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Good morning again. So we're going to start this session, uh, start today off with a um, presentation on maps. And I know that a lot of you probably a bit tired. We're starting early and uh, some of you probably woke up this morning at 3 a.m. with the sun shining directly on your face. Or maybe you went out after beer and pizza yesterday and didn't get back to your hotel till 3 a.m., which is probably more likely. So I'm going to give us a, a quick introduction to this and give you some prompts to think about while we're going through this presentation. So uh, yeah, sorry, my name is uh, Scott. I'm the analytics product manager. And then um, we're also going to have uh, Bjorn, our lead maps developer, come up and uh, give us uh, an overview of the new functionality. And then we also have uh, Maria Munez and Sylvia Wren from UNICEF joining to give us, uh, fi finish off the presentation with a little bit of information on how people are using maps and how we can encourage people to use maps more through capacity building. But to the prompts, so we know that the Maps app is probably one of the most underutilized analytics apps that we have in DHIS2, which is a true tragedy because it is an incredibly powerful tool. Of all of our apps that we have, it is probably the most advanced in terms of functionality. Um, and because it's so advanced at this point, it's actually, no, somebody, somebody's still waking up. Um, but because uh, the Maps app is, is so advanced, I think that it's actually been very hard for people to keep up with the functionality because we've been pumping out a lot of functionality continuously. And so we're gonna catch you up on that. So we're gonna look at the new features. So please pay attention to the new features. This is not the Maps app that your parents were using. This has really advanced quite a lot over the last years. But I also want you to think about as we're going through the Maps app, think about why many of you, many countries are underutilizing the Maps app. Is it that the functionality is not there? Is it that you don't have the capacity building? You don't have the strengthening? You don't have the use cases? What is it that is preventing you from using the Maps app? And then I would love to hear about that. We have a session this afternoon, is it this afternoon? Wednesday afternoon, where we're gonna go into more detail around map use. And we'd love for you to come to that session and talk to us about why you think people are not using maps. And we'd like to figure out a way to move forward together as a community. You're going to see some examples of how people are already using maps, uh, especially from uh, Sylvia and Maria. And I think this should be inspiring to you. I think that you should see how some of these countries have adopted maps and know that you can do the exact same thing. There's no reason that you can't. Then um, we also want you to make sure that um, you understand how it takes a, you know, a bit of more understanding on how we build capacity around maps. It's not like you just plop someone down in front of a, a map, you know, a blank maps app and expect them to you know, get it right away. Maps as a concept is a bit more advanced than say like a bar chart or a line graph. You know, these are really simple things that most people can understand right away. But once you do build capacity around maps, it can be the most powerful analytics tool that you have. So with that, I think I will go ahead and hand it off to our lead maps developer, Bjorn, and he is going to take us through the latest functionality. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, sometimes, like the Maps app is underutilized, and sometimes we hear that maps are looked upon as being more complicated even so complicated that people are sometimes just afraid to, to go into the Maps app and try to make one. But just to get everyone here on the same track, the Maps app is super easy. I would say, argue that it's even easier than the other analytical apps. Uh, it's very, very few selections you need to make uh, before you have actually created a map, and I will show this. But this is just to get all of you on the track. If you haven't opened the Maps app before, I hope everyone has. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can select the base maps. You have the legend to the right. And the most important button is the add layer button where you have these layers presented. Then you have thematic you use for your aggregate data. You have events and tracked ent entities you can use for individual data. And then we have two layers that you can use for your, your org units. One is specifically, specifically tailored towards the facilities, the lowest level and one that can show the full hierarchy. 
Uh, in addition, we will spend quite a bit of time of these external layers here, uh, which are from fetched from the Google Earth engine, but they are from various sources. And just to show you the proof that you can create a map in 15 seconds, uh, that will be showing now. Uh, I had an issue that, yeah, set the base map if you need to change it. Click on add layer, thematic. So the only thing you basically need to select to have a map is to select an indicator and then go with the default. And you have the map here and you can interact and click with it. So it's that simple. And then of course, later on, you can go in and change the different period, change to different, uh, different uh, org unit, uh, different district, and you can change the styling and you can even filter the data if you want to look at part of it. But just to get started, select an indicator, click add layer, and you have a map. Uh, we've added quite a few features. I'm not going to go through this list. Uh, I'm going to present some of these features today. Uh, it's not only the latest features because we have been building the, some of the features built on the others. And now we have a full package that we would like to present. Often also, I have some quite a bit of quite a few times I'm I'm presenting the latest features, but I also see very often see that it's of no use because you are maybe two or three or four or five versions behind. Uh, so the good news here is that most of you yet later today can go and create its maps. You don't need to wait for 240 to be able to do this. So just start playing with the maps app. Uh, the the most important feature for 240 was a feedback we got uh, when we had a workshop in Nairobi. You will hear more about it, uh, and that was that printed maps are the main way of sharing information in many countries. So if you have a maps you would like to share with others, you could even make a PDF. But very often, a printed map is what you would like to share. And the printing functionality in DHS2 maps was very limited. Uh, and we have improved that greatly in, in this version. Uh, another important feature I know has been requested by many was that it was only possible to display the name of the org units on the map. But you also wanted to see the actual value. And we have added that support in no in 240. Um, but what we have, what's different in this 240 is that you can click on the download and then you are entering this download mode. And here you have a lots of more possibilities to present your map. And very often the one who are going to read your map is a different person uh, than you who produce it. So it's important to tell the story around the map and not only present the map in itself because it can be hard to, to interpret. So what we've added is uh, you can add the title and the description. This map is showing birth by attended by skilled health personnel. It's in percentage. This is from the Sierra Leone database, so it's only demo data. Um, and then you can select which kind of elements you would like to have, but these are like the, the basic. So you can have a title, description, legend, an inset map can be important for people to realize where in the country it is. Uh, we have a north arrow scale bar. Yes, that's it. Uh, here also, if you get, please get feedback. Give us feedback if you would like to have more elements to this print layout and we can add it. So this is the result, quite clean map with a clear message. Uh, often you have this, when I see maps that are produced, some of the maps are often too busy because in, in the maps app, you have the power of adding a, as many layers as you like. And sometimes that can be a great feature, especially if there is a linkage you want to show between the two layers. But in, instead of, this, they come to it a cost because the, it gets much harder to read. So instead of put, trying to put everything in one map, rather make many, several multiple maps like this, which is easy to read and maybe put them side by side uh, instead. An important feature we added in 335, which I think most of you should be on now, is that we only, for aggregate data, we only had 
uh, this thematic mapping technique, which is called a coraplet, supporting supported. Uh, so this one here, the districts are colorized according to a statistical value, and this is the, a great map to use if you want to to um, to see data that is normalized per capita percentage. But it's not uh, the map you should use if you have show raw number total population. Uh, or the number of births in the districts. And the reason is that you, you will easily start to compare the different districts here with the performance across the boundaries, but it's not really telling the, the true story because often the raw data is connected to the population, to the numbers. And that's why you should also always use this, we call it the bubble map, it's often called the proportional symbol map. So please use this one. Normally this is the one you use technique you use for data elements, and this is the one you use for an indicator. Uh, changes are not only in space, they're also happening in time. So we have added two methods to show difference in time. So the first method is to have a timeline showing under the map. And then you can see this is for the last 12 months. This one is just playing, but you can also click on this different to move uh, back and forth. Uh, I think the problem here is that if you are interested in one district, you should be able to just focus on that district and see the, the changes. But as the, this, as the map as a whole, I find it very hard to remember how it was the last month when going to the next. So that's why we also added this, we call the split view which I think is much better. It comes with a cost because it's less room for each map. So for, for example, on the last map, I could also show the name and, and the value. Here is only room for the, for the values for the district, but here is much, more, much, much easier to compare the, the districts and the different performance throughout this six month period. Another feature we feel is underutilized is the event layer, which has many more styling capabilities now. So when you select an event from, from a program and it has a, a data element attached to it, you can decide to style by this data element. So instead of just showing the events at black dots, you can here see that it's styled by the mode of discharge as an example. So you can also try to get patterns uh, out of this. It works for some data elements. For example, the diagnosis, you know that can be a thousands. So trying to style by that element will make a legend far too big. But for most data elements, that should be something you can do. And also another thing with these event maps is that you can often have hundreds, even hundreds, uh, thousands, hundred thousand events. So that's why we have, ah, sorry. One more here. Uh, we have made a data table for most of the layers. Uh, so this one is showing for event layer. That was the last layer we supported. So the data table is a table view of the same data you see on the map. It was added in 235 for the event layer. And it's a great thing to, in, not the maps app is not only to show the data. It can also be a way to drill down and investigate and look for specific cases. Uh, so what we see here, you have these filtering uh, capabilities. So here mode of discharge is set to died and then age is less than 10 years. And then you are left with two events only. So you can see as you type here, the maps updates automatically as you type and you're left with the, with the, uh, with the filter. And then this one uh, is that if you, if you have many events, you can decide to group them uh, into these, these clusters that are lying close to each other. And you see here too, also we are keeping the styling. So we call these donuts, but the outer circle is showing the representation of the events inside of that um, bubble. And then in the Last couple of releases, we have worked on a lot on catchment areas. So as you know, catchment areas are the area where the, where the hospital is getting their patients from or where the school is getting their pupils from. And often that could be good to define, 
to have, uh, for example, an approximation uh, to know the number of population, for example, living within this, this area. So if you have, we don't have any built-in support for creating catchment areas. This is a very complex uh, thing to do, to create these areas. But you can easily import, I will show you different ways, you can easily import these catchment areas into the system. But when you have catchment areas, you will see in this org unit, when you select your org units for your layers, you will see you have an extra dropdown called associated geometry, and there you might see catchment areas or other types of areas defined. So the new thing here is that if you have an org unit, it can have multiple geometries attached. So normally a facility will only be a point uh, in the version you're having, but it can now also be a polygon or the area where it's so, which is the catchment area for this facility. Um, if you have 238, there is an app I would uh, advise you to check out. It's called the micro planning app from Crosscut. It will help you to automatically create these catchment areas. So it will use your facilities and it will also use your districts. And then within the district boundaries, try to define the catchment areas by, based on factors like travel distance. If there are a big river blocking, mountain ridge, uh, land cover, all these kind of factors. And this, this can be good as a starting point for your catchment areas. And then later on, you can go in and edit this manually if you see that this is wrong for this area. And then in 239, we, you can also import from any tool uh, the catchment areas you would like to use. So this one shows two examples with catchment areas. What you can do when you have imported it, whatever you select the facility points, you can now select the catchment area instead. So this one is showing a thematic map uh, where, the, where the catchment areas are colorized according to the statistical value. Uh, we will later show you how you can calculate the population within the catchment areas. But this one is also it can be a useful example. We have this detailed imagery from Bing. And especially if you're a bit uncertain, uh, because you know your, your districts, especially if you're bigger, you can zoom all the way in. You can see the individual neighborhoods and housing, and you can see where the catchment areas are drawn on top. So you can sort of ground through thing, we call it, and see, see how accurate they are. So here you will see that the catchment area is clearly defined along uh, a road. Then we are moving on to the Earth Engine layers. I know it, quite a few of you have signed up for Google Earth Engine. Now I really recommend the rest of you to do it. I think I have 30, 20 countries been signing up the last few months. Uh, the process, it used to be a complicated process. You had to do the sign up with Google yourself. Now it's super easy. It's easy is, is to send an, an email to maps at dhs2.org. You, you will find the slides and you'll find everything information there. But you only need to send an email, ask your system administrator to do it, and we will fix your access. So it's done in a few minutes. And then you will have access to these uh, uh, powerful layers. Um, so what's special with this Google Earth engine is called an engine because it's not only like a repository for data, it's also they provide all the co computing power uh, in the cloud at Google. So you can do a lot of interesting stuff with this data. Uh, but they do this, DHS2 is supported for free, no extra cost for, this is for a good project for Google, so you don't need to pay anything. What they are providing is a way for organization to upload their data. So we have data, for example, from these three organizations. They add it to Google Earth Engine. And then what we do is that we pass in the organization unit from the instance, and then we use this data to calculate. For example, we would like to calculate the population within the district on, uh, in your country. And then we get that result and present it. So, and all of this is happening on the fly when you click the add link. So this is an example of elevation in Sierra Leone. Uh, so you can see you have the base map showing the elevation with the color scale, but also we have access to the raw data. 
So if you right click anywhere on this map, you will see uh, the elevation at exactly that point. Uh, you will also, if you click on this, you will see aggregated values. You will see in this district, the max value is 1933, which is almost the same. This resolution is 30 meters, so it's almost the same as the highest point. Uh, and you can also have the mean and max. You can decide how you want this data to be aggregated. Uh, this could be used uh, for malaria risk mapping, not in Sierra Leone because it's a low altitude country. So there is malaria risk all over the country. It's not connected with altitude. But uh, this is just shown an example uh, because you can set the mean and the max. And for example, you can define that the dark color is a high risk area and the orange color is a medium risk, for example. And I did this for an academy we had in Delhi, where there were participants from Bhutan, where malaria is very connected to altitude. So then this is not created in, the data is from DHS2, I created this map in QGIS, in another GIS program, but here the red areas mark the area where there is um, malaria risk below 1,700 meters. And this is also an example of thing how effective maps can be. You're trying to describe this in words where these areas are. You will, <laughs> it is hard. And you can here also see easily that there are at least four states uh, where basically there is no malaria risk. We also have added a land cover data set, which also might be used in with vector-borne diseases and health. Uh, this one is showing, uh, so land cover or land use, it will, it will show the, how the landscape varies in, within the districts. And this one is showing a, a state there where the permanent wetlands is uh, almost 18%. And then again, if we take up the data table, you can click on the... Uh, titles there, and then you will sort the results. So here you can see these are chiefdoms. You can see the chiefdoms with uh, the most percentage of wetlands. So you can see there is a BMC state. No, uh, chiefdom here is having more than 50% of the land area is considered to be wetlands. Then finally, we're moving on to population, which is probably the most interesting in, and useful. Um, we are using population data from WorldPop. This one shows a map. This is three map layers here. You have the population density at the bottom. Then I've added chiefdoms boundaries on top, and then the health facilities. So this might be useful to see if there are areas which is not covered by a health facility, but where there is a high density population. So for example, I just added the circle in the middle there might be a kind of get date for where to add another health facility. A little bit behind the scenes, what's special with this uh, WorldPop dataset is that it's very high resolution. It's 100 by 100 meters is the resolution. And within every one cell, 100 by 100 meter cell, there is a population estimate. It's you, I definitely, this slide is from WorldPop. I would advise you to go into WorldPop and see a presentation there for how this is created. Uh, but based on a lot of data, uh, satellite imagery, roads, building footprints, uh, land use, they are able to create this model of the number of people living there. It's not necessarily completely accurate within a cell, but within a larger area, they, these estimates have been proven to be quite accurate. And then, so this is just a small area and you can see the cells with the number of people living there. And then what makes this so flexible is that we can add every layer on top. And then what we basically do is just to count the number of cells that falls in catchment one and two, and then we get the population estimate. And all of this now is built directly into DHS2 maps. So the two population layers we have is this one with a total population. 
And then during COVID-19, we understood or got feedback that it is crucial to have the different age groups. So for example, to find the, the elder population. So then we also added the population age groups layers, which is divided into a uh, gender and sex structures. So here you can see you, that you can select, uh, for example, male and female under five years, or if that is what you're interested in. Just mentioning here, uh, WorldPop has many uh, different data sets. Uh, we have added two that are globally available. They are based on a top-down approach, which means that it's taking your census data as a starting point. So when you add up the number for the year of the census, it should match the numbers. Uh, and then there are projections from that census into the future. I also know that the population data can be very disputed. This is nothing we import to the system. This is only for the you to view. It's not taking over the population data you already, already have in a DHS2 instance. This is only on, on the fly measurements in the maps app. Uh, also, the data we have is for 2020. We, we now we get a lot of requests because they want the data for this year. The good news is that WorldPop is currently taking even more newer census data where they have been in the recent years, and they will now produce these population numbers for 2020 until 2030 with projections. So what you can do with this data then is that you can try with your own Districts, uh, select the population layer, and you will instantly uh, get a, an estimate of the population within. So you can see in this Gaura, uh, you will see 24,000 in uh, estimated population. And you can also, like I said, previously use the data table much more. You can sort by them by the, by the value and have it presented like this. And then again, this is the age groups. You see, you can both see the individual age groups and also the total for the group selected. Uh, if you don't have catchment areas defined, uh, you can select a buffer. So if, if you would like to see the number, the population living within 3000 meters, for example, from a health facility, you can use this feature. So you will see here 3470, lives 3,000 meters, within 3,000 meters from this facility. If you have catchment areas, this can be defined much more accurate. So here we have the same district with the catchment area, and you will see that the population is then much higher, more than 9,000. Um, another thing we have added, this is in 237, is that we, the Maps app is probably the best app to use to have a good overview of your facilities. And there has also been a lot of discussion on the master facility list. So you are collecting a lot of data about these facilities. And what we have made is something called the org unit profile. So whenever you have a facility on your map, you click on it, you will have this view profile button. And then you will see all the information you have about the health facility. This is, can be configured so you can decide what you would like to see. You can even add an image to the health facility. You can see the name, contact person, uh, and you can also see select what kind of statistics you would like to see for each health facility. So please use this one more. Um, my last slide uh, is that we try to cover uh, many use cases with uh, DHS2 maps, but we will never be able to compete with a proper GIS system. And also, I don't think you want us to be a proper GIS system as well, because these are very complex to use. So we want most the most common task, especially if you're looking at your own data, uh, DHS2 maps should be the app you should use to make a map. But if you would like to combine your data with other data, we might in the future add more possibilities to bring on other data sources, but very often you will need to go into another program. Um, and we also had 
academies and so we see that people uh, are learning quite fast the other programs and then we have made it very easy to get data out of dhs2 into another program so you have an if you right click if you click on that menu when you have your layer there is a download data button an important thing here is that the download when you download the data for a map for example you're not only getting the org unit or the facilities you're also getting the data attached that you see on the map we see that some of people use a complicated process of going into matching data uh, linking the statistical value to the org units if you use the maps app you don't need to do it because it's already attached so just download the data and style it again in, in qgis so this is just an example uh, download the facilities then we have uh, settlement extents from grid tree so this is showing where there are settlements um, and then we are combining these two in QGIS uh, and here also you could see if there are areas that are not covered by a health facility so for example on this map I saw this seems to be a larger settlement there to the right where there is no facility That was my last slide. So we'll move on on how we can build capacity on using maps. Thanks. Okay.